a warm welcome to today's video where I will be explaining indirect realism for A-level philosophy. I would always start a response to a question, whether that's 3, 5, 12 or 25 marks on indirect realism or any other theory by explaining, by mirroring back to the exam board what they define the theory to be. That means you have a really simple way in that's clear and concise. Indirect realism has one more working part to it than direct realism. Uh, and that is an intermediary between the agent and the external world. And that is sense data. Sense data is caused by and represents, as the definition says, the external world. You can see on the diagram here how that is the case. That is the key idea. We have sense data. Now, sense data is good because it explains away lots of the issues of direct realism. It explains why we have illusions and hallucinations, for example. What we are perceiving is not the world directly, but it's our sensory experience of the world. And our sensory experience of the world can be wrong sometimes. We know that to be the case when senses are lost, for example, or the illusions of a dress that appears black and purple or white and gold. Now, we have two types of qualities. This is John Locke who distinguishes between these two things. Primary qualities, which are physical properties, mind independent, importantly, mind independent qualities that are measurable and objective. Secondary qualities are experiences of primary qualities which require a mind to perceive them. Importantly, I make a distinction in terms when I'm explaining this, or when I'm, uh, it, you know, when I'm explaining it out loud or when I'm writing about this. I define physical qualities, uh, sorry, I define primary qualities as properties and I define secondary qualities as qualities. So properties compared to qualities. This is just a small distinction which helps me understand the differences. The connotations of properties, in, in my opinion, is measurable and mathematics and engineering and objective. Whereas qualities, for me, the connotations are more of, you know, of art and of the senses and all this sort of thing. And so small little distinction there might help you understand this might help you recall this, might help you connect this uh, in your mind to, to other things. As with my previous video on direct realism, here are some extra notes. Indirect realism is easier to write about than direct realism because there is more there, there's more substance. The, the first thing is that this is also called represent uh, representational realism, or even if you get into the sort of more advanced philosophy, representational materialism. Uh, sense data, as I've said before, is, is a near perfect, is a very accurate, but not entirely accurate representation of the world. And as I've also said, this theory is developed from issues of direct realism. Uh, and so it does effectively deal with issues of illusion and hallucination and perceptual variation. Now, we do have some criticisms with the theory, of course. These are quite important because not only do they connect to indirect realism, but <coughs> sorry, but they <coughs> they connect to the theory of idealism, which is George Berkeley. The first criticism is the veil of perception. And now this is because we have an intermediary between mind and the external world. We can never make contact with physical objects themselves. OK, so all I understand of the world, all I know of the world is my perception. I take away my perceptions, I take away my experiences of physical objects and there is nothing. OK. To, as far as I know, there is still an external world which exists. But as, as far as I know, there is 
all I've got are my ideas of the world. And that's caused by my perceptions. What this means is we can take this in two different directions. The first direction we can take this is to scepticism. We can never truly be certain. So there is room for rational doubt about the existence of the external world. I could be a brain in a vat. I could be uh, in the illusion of an evil demon, for example. That's, that's one place you can take this. So Locke does have responses. He does have responses, but ultimately he accepts that there are limits to this theory. We can't truly know, we can't truly verify the existence of the mind independent world. And for some, that means it's an incomplete and unpalatable theory of perception. You can decide for yourself whether you think this is enough of a reason to do that. And then this also leads to solipsism. Now, solipsism is this idea of an alone mind, an alone self. Think of uh, you being the only, the only mind, your perceptions being caused by chemicals, being caused by electrical waves, whilst you're simply a brain in a vat. And so solipsism is where you can take this next. And if a theory leads to solipsism, again, for some, it is simply unpalatable. It is not a working theory. It is an incomplete theory. It's not knocking down the theory completely as convincingly or unconvincingly. You make that choice, as Barclay does with his attack on primary second equalities. But I'm jumping ahead of myself. There are three possible responses. Well, there are many more, but there are three responses here that I'll cover. Um, Cockburn, a female philosopher, also is credited uh, on the spec. She's in the um, the textbook. So you, this is that's some extra reading that you could do if you want to do. But these are the three criticisms that I'll explain. The first one is uses a distinction between voluntary and involuntary perceptions. We know that the external world is not caused by our own mind. It's not mind dependent because there's a clear difference in my experience of mind dependent perceptions and mind independent perceptions. Voluntary perceptions as opposed to involuntary perceptions. In my own mind, I can have a voluntary perception of me scoring the winning goal in the World Cup final for England. That is very different. That's a very different experience to the experience of being stuck in traffic, for example, which is involuntary. Because we can discern between these things, I understand that my perceptions every day are involuntary. I don't control them. And so they're mind dependent. They're mind dependent. Sorry. They are mind independent. My perceptions of the world are mind independent because the nature of them, the experience of those perceptions is very different to perceptions which are dependent on the mind, like my fantasy about scoring in the World Cup final for England. The second criticism is about our senses. Our senses are coherent with, with one another and that means because my eyes can verify the existence in the external world of a pen and so can my hands and so could my mouth there seems to be an external standard so there's objects which exist and these are independently verified they've got qualities which are verifiable independent of one another and so my experience tells me that the external world does exist. These two criticisms are good, but the third one is my favourite. This is from Bertrand Russell. Now, he argues that the external world is the best hypothesis. We have an intuition that is always verified about the external world existing. And we also have this theory that the external world exists, this intuition, which is almost never contradicted. OK, I'm, I'm not going to stretch it as far as never contradicted, but very, very, very rarely do I ever have the thought, mm, maybe there's not an external world. 
this is different from a brain in a vat or the evil demon hypothesis where okay it's possible and there is room for some rational uh questioning that maybe i am a brain in a vat but we've got no positive reason we've got no reason for believing in a brain in a vat we've only got reasons against it and so we've got no real reason for genuine belief in the brain in a vat hypothesis or the evil demon hypothesis and what this means is well the external world is the best one because it's the only one it's the only one that we've got this positive genuine reason for believing and then finally we've got a more technical one we've got Barclay's attack on primary and secondary qualities to conceive of an apple without smell taste sight etc is not to conceive of an apple at all so if we picture in our mind uh, what an apple is and we take away all of our secondary qualities we've got no apple so that's one part and the second part is even primary qualities have some variability to them and so they're not objective and so they're not mind independent they're dependent on the mind a six foot seven man if i stood next to him would appear very tall if i see him while standing on a hot air balloon or out of a helicopter window, suddenly the man seems very, very small. What this means is the quality of size is varied. Okay, I've got the same man, and yet my experience of that, my experience of size, a so-called objective mind-independent quality, is varied. And so, secondary qualities and primary qualities are both dependent on the mind. And that leads to idealism. We can push back on this, though. Again, it's your choice. You decide which one is more convincing. When you do your mind maps, when you do your practice questions, when you are explaining it to people, you should always be evaluating. It's a great way to learn. And so you decide which one of these is stronger. But here's the counter. I'm going to read from this because it is a bit technical. Barclay argues that because perceptual variation can cause primary qualities to appear differently, they must be mind dependent. But this is a misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding because if the external world changes our sensory experience, oh, sorry, if the external world changes, our sensory experience may change, like being in a hot air balloon. What does not change is the fact that objects possess shape extension etc now what do i mean by this when we think of the tall man from a hot air balloon what what barclay is saying changes is he says that the size changes what he means is the appearance of size changes the appearance of size changes not size itself the size of the man does not change. And the fact that the man has the thing called size, the property called size, the property called extension, that does not change. My sensory experience might change, but well, yeah, of course it changes. Okay, sense data is dependent on the mind. That's true. A deodorant spray, for example, may appear to smell differently as I walk across the room from where I sprayed it. But what is objective is the fact that the molecules of the spray have shape and extension. So the smell might appear differently, but there are still atoms actually in the room, molecules actually in the room, which have shape and extension. Primary qualities appear varied, but it does not follow that they are dependent on the mind. Our sense data is dependent on the mind and that's what's changing thank you for watching this is a technical theory i hope you've understood it if you haven't leave questions i'm very willing to explain those please like and share the video if you found it helpful thank you for watching